we'll uh, all get a chance to ask questions of the speakers uh, during the discussion session. Now I want to introduce the second speaker today, Lori Jo Reynolds. I think I had a terrible journey from Chicago, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, Lori Jo Reynolds, let me put my glasses on. Very good. Is a video artist, activist, and researcher who has organized various prison reform and abolition efforts, primarily focused on the TAMS Supermax prison in TAMS, Illinois. In 2007, Reynolds organized TAMS Year 10, a coalition of prisoners, ex-prisoners, families, and concerned citizens that produced cultural, political, and educational programming in an effort of protest and reform. Her project Space Ghost in 2007 juxtaposes found video footage of incarcerated prisoners and astronauts in an effort to display correlations of isolation, confinement, and distance from society. Reynolds is a film and video professor currently at Loyola University and Columbia College, both in Chicago. Please welcome Lori Jo Reynolds. Hi, everyone. Let me get it worked out. Max Prison in Southern Illinois was designed for solitary confinement with no human contact, no phone calls, no communal activity, no contact visits. Food is pushed through a slot in the door. Prisoners never leave the cell except to shower or exercise alone in a concrete room or in cages if they're mentally ill. Long-term isolation and sensory deprivation, the cold storage warehousing of human beings, provokes mental breakdowns. In an international human rights framework, it is considered a form of torture. As an artist, how do I communicate the experience of long-term isolation, and what is my goal in doing it? In 2001, I organized Ask Me, a live human installation where experts on various topics sat in booths and answered your questions, like Lucy. One booth was Tam Supermax Prison, and the experts were family members. These were curated conversations, and icebreaker questions were provided. At the TAMS booth, you could ask a mother, is your son really the worst of the worst? This is Mary and Maria, who had a son and a brother in TAMS. Uh, sorry. Uh, originally told you would be there one year. This is their worst of the worst. Mary said that going down to visit her son is like going to his tomb. He sits behind glass like he's in a coffin. He's dead, but he's alive. Mary's son has now been there 13 years. Another approach was this experimental video called Space Ghost. It's structured by a metaphor between outer space and prison. Why? To address the experience of isolation, sensory deprivation, and the reality of living in a separate parallel universe from your family, a common experience in this era of long prison sentences. This video has no statistics, no solutions, no demands. Just a way to imagine long-term incarceration. Meanwhile, <clears throat> years passed, and men are still in isolation at Tam Supermax. Okay, the story is now a parable. There's an artist and there's a man at the bottom of the well. The artist has the urge to tell people about him and to make art about him, and she does. At what point does the artist, who knows all about this man, try to get him out? In 2006, the TAMS Poetry Committee started. We sent letters and poetry to every prisoner in TAMS to provide them with some social contact. It remains a necessary project. Hi, committee, is this for real? I can't believe someone cares enough to send a pick-me-up to the worst of the worst. Well, if nobody else has said it, I will. Thank you. But at a certain point, this <coughs> man of the well question <coughs> came up from the prisoners themselves. One prisoner wrote, hey, this poetry is great, but could you please tell the governor what they're doing to us down here? 
this prisoner was saying, take some political responsibility. In 2008, we turned to legislative art. The TMZ attended campaign to reform the Supermax was launched at the 10-year anniversary of its opening. At that point, one-third of the prisoners had been in isolation the entire decade. Obviously, any relief for these men could only come by challenging power in what artists sometimes call a real-world system, specifically the real-world system that controls which bodies go into which prisons and for how long. So we looked at the three branches of government, judicial, executive, and legislative. Since excellent attorneys had already sued, and since our governor was Rob Lugoyevich, that left the legislative branch. See, really anyone can do this analysis. <laughs> we decided to pursue our state legislators and urge them to provide oversight at the Supermax. Prison reform is hard enough, but getting people to stand up for the worst of the worst was considered politically hopeless. We had a series of public events with these organizing principles. Anything could be made into a TAMS event. <clears throat> Every event had a goal. First, create a space for contemplation, and then bam, ask for specific political action. Not permitted, just putting information out into the ether. Most importantly, always foreground the testimony of prisoners and ex-prisoners. They can undo the myth of the worst of the worst. Here's what David wrote. I've been in TAMS for eight years and have not been able to embrace, hug, or hold my loved ones or any other person. I have not felt a single simple handshake in all those years. David has been in prison since age 19 and in isolation for 12 years now. And Robert was mentally ill and begged us for help. People at TAMS have me on so much medication it's not funny. 900 milligrams lithium, 0.5 milligrams risperidale. Since I've been at TAMS, I hung myself, cut myself, and bit on myself. But these people say there's nothing wrong with me. He died mysteriously last year at age 33 after 10 years in isolation. You're looking at his last grievance. In this spirit, we held hearings, introduced legislation, negotiated with the IDSC, organized meetings, forums, lobby days, press conferences, rallies, prayer vigils, parsley eating contests, and built a huge coalition. We collaborated with artists and cultural workers on projects to draw people into the campaign and get publicity. One project, Supermax Subscriptions, allows people to donate unused frequent flyer miles to buy magazines for prisoners, thus connecting the surplus of the well-traveled to guys who never leave their cell. This prisoner commended the project as a work of art and a gesture of sincere humanity. And no, he requested Martha Stewart living and working mother. <laughs> Here's a special gallery performance where we reenacted moments from the legislative campaign. Afterwards, an audience member asked Daryl, an ex camps prisoner, what's the difference between giving your testimony in real life at a legislative hearing or his art here in the gallery? He answered, there is no difference between art and life. Our mud stenciling blast was a tactical media project. We got art and leisure press for this unique form of ecological messaging and about our legislation. <clears throat> and here's a brand new project where we ask prisoners to request a photograph of anything at all and we'll take it. What would some, someone in isolation want? Mark wants a gray and white warm-blooded horse jumping in cold weather so you can see his breath. Robert, Egyptian artifacts. Jose and Sergio want flags, the Mexican flag of the Zocalo at sunrise. Darius, his neighborhood between 2 and 4 p.m. at 64th and Marshfield, facing west. We got requests from mosques in Saudi Arabia, a Baptist church in southern Illinois, and pictures of Jesus. This is the one request we have fulfilled because this prisoner is dying. Some people wanted photographs of themselves. Ike wanted a photograph within a photo of him and the lakefront, Navy Pier, wild lions, wild wolves, and a Chinese dragon. <laughs> we were moved by the number of people who wanted pictures of the people of TMC Year 10. I'd just like to be able to put the faces to the names we've seen over the years so the humanity of each can shine forth. A name on paper at the end of the day is still just a name on paper. After 17 months, we build up enough pressure that our governor appointed a new IDSC chief to review the Supermax as his first task. Yay! 
In reaction, the Chicago Tribune wrote a shoddy, factually incorrect, and asinine editorial about TAMS. <laughs> to express our discontent, we picketed and delivered 10 corrections to the editorial board on stone tablets. A few months later, the IDSC director announced a 10-point reform plan, which included introduction of phone calls, communal religious services, due process safeguards, and the transfer of one-fifth of the current prisoners, so much for the worst of the worst, and more. Just days before this reform was announced, we had a party on the right side of history to honor these principled legislators who advocated for TAMS prisoners. We also had a special ceremony to celebrate ourselves for not being bystanders to torture in Illinois. Note, it is extremely rare for prisons to be reformed, and this one still isn't. This great director was pushed out, and we're still fighting with the IDSC for the full implementation of the 10-point plan. Here at our last meeting, you can see the backs of the IDSC director and the warden of TAMS. Behind them sat Demir, one of the first prisoners of TAMS who was released just a month before. Here's how we knew him. I think we're the only Supermax campaign that brings ex-Supermax prisoners to the table to argue policy with their former captors. Willie Sutton said he robbed banks because that's where the money is. We work with governments because that's where the power is. State government is a good target. It's easy to find out where to apply pressure and to find good public servants who need your support. Two such great bureaucrats were pushed out this year, and we fought for them, on principle and for the pure expression of it. Artists are uniquely qualified to change law and policy, and we should not relinquish this territory to the non-artists. We know how to attempt the impossible, fail grandly, and start over. We're free in the existential sense, in the world, not of it. Those of us taken with existentialism, nonsense, and the theater of the absurd are specially positioned to relish the legislative arts. It is really a lot of paperwork. It's especially important for the public to be involved in criminal justice policy. Legislators have stoked the public's fear of crime, especially parents' fears about their children, even while violent crime rates go down. Politicians and the media play out fantasies of vengeance and then inscribe them into law. What's missing, most of all, are evidence-based policies about how to prevent crime. Reducing future victims should be the goal. And secondly, what's missing, the perspectives of the millions of Americans and their families who experience these policies. Here's a budding new project to help reorient people in what we're doing in corrections. SAS Cell PC. Select the appropriate sentence cell and prison conditions. You learn about a crime and choose the appropriate sentencing and prison conditions. Then you're asked to imagine that your own child committed the offense. And you get to make choices based on what you think he or she should go through in the criminal justice system. You can even choose a cell type. Early research shows that for strangers, people select very long sentences, harsh prisons, and no rehabilitation. When it's their child, the opposite. The challenge of TNF Year 10 was deconstructing the notion of the worst of the worst. This shortcut for dehumanizing people has allowed the return of solitary isolation, a practice that was all but shunned for 100 years in U.S. correctional history because of the known cruelty and mental damage it causes. Long-term isolation has now become a new normal feature of prison, of prison and detention used for juveniles, immigrants, mentally ill prisoners, military detainees like Bradley Manning, and even ordinary rule breakers. Over the past 15 years, the same reckless demonization and erasure of social being has been extended to another wide net of people, a new worst of the worst, who have been put in a different sort of exile, sex offenders. Over the past, uh, sorry, it was a feminist insight that sexual victimization is endemic and entrenched pattern in our families and communities, and that's still true. But this radical critique by feminists has been hijacked and distorted by legislators and the news media who have persuaded us to instead fear a new class of people, sexually perverted strangers who may strike at any time. But sex crimes, even violent ones, overwhelmingly take place among people who already know each other. Heinous stranger crimes against children are very, very, very rare. Children are more at risk from their own parents. Family members account for 68% of the murders of children under five, and 51% of girls under 18. 
but we're very focused on the danger posed by strangers in public parks, bus stops, and state fairs. Instead of concrete evidence-based policies to break cycles of violence, legislators passed sweeping laws with no policy foundation that put over half a million people in public registries and spent tremendous law enforcement resources to track and regulate them. Who's on the sex offender registry? Well, first of all, they're not the people who are going to commit the crimes next year. 95% of the new convictions from sex crimes will come from people who are not on the registry. So oddly enough, if you just focus on the sex offender registry, you're ignoring 95% of the new sex crimes. That said, who are sex offenders? Sex offenders are people who have to register as sex offenders. Legislators make the decision about who will be listed as a sex offender. Whether you are a sex offender depends on your offense, your state, the state you live in, and when you committed it. On these lists are obvious offenses and also less obvious offenses, such as sexual assault, inappropriate contact with a child, incest, sexual contact with minors, child porn, uh, sexting, public indecency, public urination, soliciting prostitutes, pandering, etc. Texas actually has a very wide net, including Romeo and Juliet offenders, which is basically teen sex with a three-year age difference. And they're labeled for life, lifetime sex offender registration. Texas has a huge registry, over 64,000 people already, and an average of 100 are added each week. It's a category error, a thought error, to lump together this huge variety of offenses under one label. And there's no scientific, psychological, sociological, criminal, criminological, or even practical reason for doing it. There's also no reason to target them the same way for future supervision. Sex offenders actually have much lower recidivism rates than other crimes. The overwhelming majority will not commit any sex crime. 86% will not. So now we have a complicated web of laws to publicize sex offenders and restrict where they live, work, travel, and move. And these requirements are often for life. Public registry, community notification, residency restrictions, exclusion zones from being 500 to 200 feet within a school, park, daycare, etc. Often, even if there's not a child victim at all. There are many detailed daily restrictions also, depending on what state you live in. Again, these laws only address those responsible for 5% of the sex crimes that will be reported, because the rest will come from people who are not even on the registry who we're not even thinking about. Unfortunately, there's no laws that even, no evidence that even these laws deter crime, but they do increase the risk set factors for recidivism by pushing people into homelessness, joblessness, and social isolation. You've probably seen clusters of homeless sex offenders in the news, living in tents, under bridges, in office parks, Others just stop registering. The laws also co-punish victims and their families. Oops, sorry. That's the exclusion zone in Dubuque. The laws also co-punish victims and families. Many sex crimes are between family members. If the family reunites, then a victim also has to live in a house on the registry and shares the shame, stigma, and ostracism. They also suffer from one breadwinner not being able to get a job. And extremely harsh penalties make it harder for some victims to report crimes. If someone's in their family, they may not want to ruin his or her life. They're forced to choose between pushing a person off the cliff or not reporting. We've gotten to the point that we can't even imagine other ways to deal with sexual violence. But look, Hollow Water Nation found out in the 1980s that they had astronomically high numbers of victims and sexual abusers. They instituted a comprehensive program of accountability, treatment, and healing through community circles for both the perpetrators and the victims. There was no shaming. The entire community took responsibility for the crimes. In only a decade, they brought sex offending rates down to 2% recidivism. They created a cycle of prevention. They took it as a public health problem. When you take the time to hear from people on the registry, you discover that life is often about losing your housing, losing your job, becoming a shut-in, or being afraid. But most people don't talk to people on the registry. From D'Angelo, being a registered sex offender really scares me. You hear things all the time, like, oh, if the guy's moves into my block, I'll kill him. 
People hate us and don't want to see some of us have went to grooves that have changed or are changing. I don't have much hope for the future. In Chicago, we started this series of complicated, invitation-only performance events to build dialogue between people in the registry, policy advocates, and cultural workers. Because we don't take pictures, I invited the artist Gretchen Hassa to sketch the individuals giving testimony, each with completely different offenses and completely different unintended consequences from living on the registry. This is the cake we serve. The overwhelming majority of people in the registry will not commit a new sex crime, and yet there's nothing in our culture to show or think about how their reintegration and forgiveness might happen. When someone returns from prison, how do we say, you made a mistake, but you still belong in our society. We want to help you stay on the right track. This project, Sex Offender Coming Home, invents such a moment. Here's what it might look like in Brooklyn, where you can pay a guy $50 to play a sex offender. <laughs> this series provokes the viewer to imagine something that there's no space in our culture to represent. Healthy social connections versus ostracism and banishment. <laughs> Convicted sex offenders released into the community are trying to work through it on their end, trying to be good citizens. But it's hard to get the community to live up to its end of the bargain. That's a bureaucrat talking. The song Tie Yellow Ribbon was originally about a prisoner coming home, not a soldier. And job offer. It turns out this idea isn't just a provocative, esoteric art project. Circles of support and accountability addresses precisely this moment for sex offenders leaving prison and facing community hatred, started by Mennonites in Canada. Circles of volunteers and professionals brace and support the ex offender through his reintegration, with dramatic drops in reoffending, like 100% non reoffending. It turns out dealing with the whole person works, and Minnesota Corrections is now piloting this program. Again, legislators are speeding in the opposite direction. Illinois passed 12 new sex offender laws last term, and this term there's literally two dozen more. Lobbying is hanging around the state house and trying to talk to legislators in lobbies. To talk to them, you have to lure them off the House or Senate floor. How do you do it? You give them your business card. Do you give your business card to a doorman who gives it to them? Why not make it count and give them a handy set of questions to ask before they vote for sex offender legislation? Many legislators admit these bills are wrong, but they simply can't resist voting for them. It's an addition. These mantra cards can help them fight the urge. <laughs> One for strength. I can be tough on crime and still not vote for any more sex offender restrictions. People will still like me if I don't vote for any more sex offender restrictions. One for self-affirmation. I am a good legislator and I care about public policy. I look at the evidence, I look at the research, I ask tough questions. I'm smart on crime, I'm not a lemmy. I believe in evidence-based correction practices. This is a true crisis of lawmaking. Lawmakers sponsor these bills so they can campaign about how tough they are on sex offenders. Then all the other legislators have to vote for them or risk being the victim of a direct mail attack that they were soft on, them, on sex offenders. Here's a project to turn around that problem by producing legitimate scare ads. Tom Price won't spend your money on laws that don't protect you from sex offenders just to help business as usual politicians get reelected. Price voted against laws that waste money and pander to fear. Does our state have money to burn? Then, okay. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Okay. <laughs> then, <laughs> the next card is an homage to the conceptual artist Adrian Piper, who is black but sometimes mistaken for white. This is her 1988 calling card. Dear friend, I am black. I'm sure you did not realize this when you made, laughed at, and agreed with that racist remark. And she goes on to say, I regret any discomfort my presence is causing you, just as I'm sure you regret the discomfort your racism is causing me. <clears throat> Here's the SO calling card. Dear friend, I am a registered sex offender. I'm sure you did not realize this when you stated that all sex offenders should have their balls cut off, be castrated, be raped, etc. That said, I do understand why there's so much hate directed at sex offenders. There's a lot that could happen at this point. I could correct any misconceptions you have. I could give you information about my offense. 
I can explain why many sex offender laws are counterproductive. I respect your decision and wish you the best. Here's one for parents. Juveniles, by the way, are responsible for well over one third of the sex offenses against children and minors. Dear parent, because you have children of your own, you understand the need to protect children from sexual abuse and other crimes. You fear for their safety. But as a parent, you must also know that your child might be the one who makes the mistake. After all, the most common age of a sex offender, as reported to law enforcement, is age 14. Who are these kids who download illegal porn, engage in sexual activity with younger peers, participate in sexting, or sexually assault another? Are they always someone else's children? This is a reverse engineering of fear. Don't just worry about your child being a victim, worry about them becoming a perpetrator. And finally, dear liberal or leftist or civil libertarian or criminal justice reformer or prison abolitionist, you're missing out on the greatest civil rights issue of our time. For years, the stigmatization of SOs has been so absolute and compelling, the progressives of every stripe, including artists, have remained silent. Even critical resistance to the radical prison abolition movement omitted mention of sex offenders at their inaugural and tenure conferences, even though by then this issue had transformed the criminal justice landscape. Ironically, it has been law enforcement, child advocates, and even prosecutors who have offered the strongest objections to sex offender laws. The title of this talk comes from Paul Gauguin's great canvas, Where Do We Come From? What Are We? Where Are We Going? He happens to have been a sex offender, although that term didn't exist. When he painted this in Tahiti, he was at a low ebb, lonely, broke, sick, an outcast, a stranger, contemplating suicide. The title suggested a ray of hope. It was derived in part from the greetings that native Tahitians gave friends and strangers. Where do you come from? Who are your mother and father? Are you going to another island? They are questions that take heed of the past and anticipate and acknowledge the future. We warehouse, isolate, and banish whole categories of people without bothering to ask them about their past or helping them construct new futures. This refusal is a hallmark of our criminal justice system. If policymakers can't ask these fundamental questions about the people we punish, then artists must. 